number one Iron Age booty daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to A Drink With Crazy. Today, I am going to get into my Crimson Wren of the True North review. And honestly, this is a book that I've been looking forward to for a long time because I have Shadowbinders 1 and 2 here in the hardback. I absolutely love that Clownfish is doing hardback books because I have cats and dogs and children and terrifies me to have books around the house with those things but if you guys enjoy what i do here on the channel do me a favor like this video subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell above all of those things though the one thing that i have seen that really helps this channel out is if you guys hit that share button and you share it with all of your friends and family uh and maybe some people who are a little bit on the fence about getting into indie comics or graphic novels and stuff like that share this video with them i would really love to walk them through my thoughts on crimson wren so without any further ado let's get into it so crimson wren of the True North is a prequel story, is an origin story to the guy that we got introduced to in the Shadowbinders Volumes 1 and 2. And honestly, this is a really fun time. I had I, I had a fun time with this. I had a relaxing time with this. When Clownfish TV told you that this was going to be inspired by your 80s, you know, uh, movies like The Goonies and whatnot, and how it 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 really just wants to take you on an adventure and just have that childlike whimsy to it. They were not lying. That is exactly what they delivered here. So one of the things that uh, this gets into is obviously the origin of Crimson Wren. So you're going to see some characters that are familiar to you from Shadowbinders. Now, it's interesting to see how how much different Crimson Wren is, where he's a little bit more calculating and a little bit more stoic and a little bit more of a ladies' man, obviously, <laughs> in Shadowbinders. And here he's just a kid. He's just a kid. Going from start to finish through this book, I realized one thing is that it goes a little fast for me, to be perfectly honest. And what I mean by fast is I kind of thought about it. As it progressed, I felt that the pacing matched the story they were trying to tell. In the front end of the book, getting the establishing moment set up, and, and I, I felt that they kind of rushed to that a little too quickly in my personal opinion. But overall, it wasn't something that broke the narrative for me, especially once I got to the end of the book and I realized we're going to have more volumes of this adventure. We're going to see this character develop into who he developed in Shadowbinders 1 and 2. So being introduced to him, we are going to uh, say he, from a young age, was a powerful, powerful mage in the world and had absolutely no control over it. The guy in, and was somewhat klutzy. So... <laughs> There are definitely some moments in the book where you're just like, wow, he just straight up has just biologically is just strong with his magic. But the guy couldn't hit the broad side of a barn and kind of ping pong balls his magic off of a few things. And that leads into why his name is, in fact, Crimson Wren. Going through, the artwork is very, very solid. It uh, the, Their artist that they got for this, which is art by Jose Garcia, is incredibly solid. I mean, I'll show you just this front page here. That artwork is absolutely fantastic, and they did a very... I mean, Gar Jose Garcia did a very, very good job. You definitely capture those Treasure Planet vibes from this, though same feelings that I got from the first book. Now, the story narrative overall, again, it's it's a fairly simple one. It follows stories like the Goonies and those treasure hunt films from the 80s where, you know, some some preteens or kids had to go out and they had to they, they had to go on this adventure and they had to learn through their experiences with little adult supervision and honestly come into their own. This is the start of that story. And honestly, I think that it's a pretty solid start. So Moving on through the book, you find out how his name was Crimson Wren, and I thought that was a little bit cheeky, a little bit on the nose, but it did fit with the beginning of the story, and I liked what happened after that. I liked how the legend of Crimson Wren 
began because not only are you going to see how he got his name, you're going to see how the legend begins. And it's kind of funny. And I, I, I really liked that because thinking in my head, I'm like, yeah, yeah, those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know how stories spread, right? It's a game of telephone. And so, you know, the guy, he ends up calling himself Crimson Wren or a, a compatriot of his calls himself, calls him Crimson Wren. And then the story gets spread in like a game of telephone. All of a sudden there's this mass legend and kind of like William Wallace, he's seven foot tall and shoots, you know, you know, lightning from his arse. And <laughs> but truthfully, I've been waiting for this book since November. Um, I love Clownfish TV. I love the story that they're telling here. There was only one thing that really, really uh, kind of messed with me. And I don't know if it was an artistic choice. I don't know if it's my own ignorance to the uh, to the books itself, uh, to comics being that I am, uh, you know, somewhat of a new reader to uh, uh, comic books. But there were a few panels in the page and it and it was a recurring theme in some areas where it felt like the panels were getting cut off prematurely from the page um i think it was an artistic style because it did repeat and it's something that just caught me off guard um wasn't enough for me to say that i i think it was a bad decision but it was enough that i went okay this is weird this doesn't quite look like what i'm used to seeing in a book usually the panels are fully on page and especially when you get those four panels that go all the way down the page the bottom panel didn't have uh, the border around it in some instances. And that was just a different choice for me to read. The story overall was told very well. The characters themselves were actually told very well. The dialogue itself was written well, and the artwork was amazing. Again, outside of the pacing, I felt that the intro of the book could have been a little bit longer. Just just let just stew just a little bit more on that intro to really, really get that uh, 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 that feeling, that emotion. And then the rest of the book could have been just just left as it was. But to get to that that point where they go on their adventure, just I don't I don't know. I don't know. Pages, panels. I'm not I don't I'm not the guy that did. I'm I'm who am I to to say how much more? I just felt that I really could have. I, I think I really could have resonated with just a little bit more in the front, uh, maybe a little bit of a slower pacing in the front. The rest of the book's pacing is actually really wonderful. I like the way that they did that. But outside of the the choice that they made for some of the panels to be done in the way that they did and the pacing in the front of the book, well, what do I think of this? My rating is simple, guys. For those of you who are on my channel, for those of you guys who know how I like to rate the books that I buy, it's a simple thing. Buy or do not buy. The thing that talks loudest is money. Would I spend and will I spend my hard-earned dollars on the next Crimson Wren? Will I spend my hard-earned dollars on the next Shadow Binders, which they've announced Shadow Binders 3? Yes. Yes, I would. No book for me is perfect, and maybe that's just because I'm a dad and I'm always trying to tell, you know, clean your room, do this, do that. I don't know. But... Is it enjoyable for me? Absolutely. I love the stories. Totally took me back to watching The Goonies, and I'm actually going to rent it this week because of this book. If you guys have never seen The Goonies, watch The Goonies. It's amazing. But this is something I could put in the hands of my kids. It's something I think that they would love. And as I get more of these, as they produce more of these, I think that there's definitely a great story where you can follow the story of Crimson Wren of the True North as a child and then follow the adventures of Shadowbinders and see him as an adult at the same time. So overall, Clownfish TV, you guys did it again. I I I just really enjoy your style of writing. I do. I do. And again, I you know, there's a couple of things that I can point to and go, "Eh, those stuck out to me." But at the end of the day, I'm reading it again. I'm giving it to my kids. I'm buying the next one, and I will be buying Shadowbinders 3 because they know what they're doing, guys. They really know what they're doing. Hardback covers. I mean, this stuff, I love having hardback covers, especially in my house where things can get damaged and destroyed. I hope that you guys, if you have the chance to check out Crimson Wren, please do. It's a fun story. It's a simple story. And I feel that if you guys are, 
and old like me, this will take you on an adventure uh, similar to the ones that you've seen in the past. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking out this video. Thank you so much for checking out my review of Crimson Wren of the True North. And hopefully you guys will be able to pick it up. Hopefully Clownfish TV has a way for you to buy it. And as always, until next time, cheers, everybody. Thank you all so much for checking out this video. And I would ask, beg, borrow, and steal just to get you guys to click the links down in the description below to join my Gilded server and my drinkwithcrazy.locals.com. Oh, and by the way, just in case you guys didn't know, I'm also over on Rumble as well. So click that link while you're down there. See you next time.